Believe it or not, not all of these videos are easy to get right or easy to record. And the Koenigsberg class are one of the ones who've perhaps been the most interesting on that regard for the cruisers so far. In that I am recording what is probably the ninth version of this particular presentation and discussion actually on the 8th and actually half an hour after the previous video the video was actually supposed to go live but i didn't like it i'd had it up for a week and i was watching it for earlier and i didn't like it I didn't say what needed to be said and the Gwynigsberg class are a class which needs stuff said about them because they are many things. They are many, many things. But they are not, by any stretch of the imagination, conventional mine laying cruisers, light cruisers, or anything in that regard. They are uniquely German Navy, uniquely. Or perhaps most extremely illustrates the issues with the German Navy in the 1920s and 1930s. Gönigsberg class are many things and can fit in many categories when you look at their stats, but when you actually dig into them, they don't. Honestly. The Koenigsberg class are a mess. What well, isn't a mess? I was looking at that, eh? Yeah, well, as I'm doing this recording this there, I thought I'd put in an up to date version of this. Um, HMCS Hyder funding trip has reached £2,490. So thank you ever so much, everyone. I mean, honestly. I have no words to describe the generosity, and I'm really not used to it. So thank you very much, everyone. It's going to be a wonderful trip. We're going to be booked in the sort of a lot soon. I'm dealing with various details at the moment, but I'm hoping to announce them soon. By the end of this month, maybe beginning of next and have all sorts of further details, and have details of where things can take place. Also, one of the things for my Canadian subscribers, and this is something to think about, and I'm going to open it up as a Discord discussion, basically say, if you want to have others, I will, if the, I will put a Canadian trip up on Discord, and comment away below if you have it, but if you would like to do a uh, get together dinner or something for the people who are in the area if you would like to have that in the Hamilton area while we're up there we will arrange it and we will have make sure there is a place booked if there's going to be enough people otherwise there'll be a case of ad hoc we're eating here that evening we're taking recommendations barbecue places especially um barbecue and burger joints but, but those are Mine and Drax style, basically, we enjoy places which have um, high meat to everything else ratios in terms of food. <laughs> um, yeah, neither of us would ever be accused of being a vegetarian. I know it's better for your health, some people, many people claim, but, um, but thank you. Let a Koenig Spolsky. They were. Built and ordered in 1926, they started off with. And in many ways, they're based on World War One era designs, but a corruption of World War One era designs. And I often say, I, I, I will say that openly. World War One had an inter the, the German designs of World War One for mine layers had an instinctual understanding of what they needed for World War One. That's not necessarily the same as what you need for World War II. 
one of the things that often comes out, people look at them and go, well, they've got nine, broadly speaking, six inch guns. Yes, they have, but as you can see, they're not uniformly positioned. And the reason they're not uniformly positioned is partially to do with the mines and the organization of them, but also to do with the engine layouts, the layout of the shafts, and the way they're balanced on the hull. This means you have a rather interesting diagram if you look to, uh, down the bottom left hand of the screen. A diagram which shows you just how mm, skewiff their firepower is. They are mean and fighting looking ships, certainly, but. And this could well be coming from a traditionalist for me, but. If you're building a mine layer, and one of the interesting examples you use if you look at the FDL class and the other mine layers that Joan produced, you. Don't, uh, whilst theoretically having firepower over your stern is an advantage because you're withdrawing after dropping off the mines, normally that's not actually where you put the firepower. Why? Because then you have a load of shells stored not far from a lot of mines. And honestly, you'd like to keep the two separate away. If, if all the mines got, yes, you've got 120 mines aboard, you're probably not going to have much of a ship left. But you still, as a rule, don't like them kept too close to where you store shells. This is not only the storage of shells. In the Abdeel class, of course, it's balanced out. But it's not the vast majority of shells are stored down there. And that's the problem. The mines are stored in the same part of the hull as the vast majority of the 150mm shells. Ouch. I mean, the back half of this ship is pretty much a floating bomb. Warships tend to be fairly close to the idea of a floating bomb, but the back half of this ship is pretty much nowhere near where I'd want to go and be. There are torpedoes on the deck, and she carries 12 of them in four triple launchers. But there are also mine, and there are six inch shells. Oh, and there are also the 88 millimeters are there as well. It's... You can make the claim it's being, trying to be efficient, etc. Putting the engines in one spot, all the explosives in the other. But in a light cruiser, well, with this particular design, the fact that all three are lost in various circumstances, one is sunk in an air attack in 1940, one is scuttled following a submarine attack in 1940, and one is sunk in an air attack in 1945. There is quite a strong suspicion in me, a strong suspicion, that I might be wrong. That this was not unrelated to the fact of their explosive storage capacity. Interestingly enough, though. They are theoretically, on paper, able to match into a Crown Colony class in firepower. Well, one of the free turret versions. And out for outperform, and a leader, a Leander. Myself, though, if I had to pick whether to be in a Königsberg class or a Leander in a fight, I'd go with Leander. It might have one less six inch gun, or one less roughly 150 or something millimeters of gun, 
that um, if I was on the Leander, I'd be basically going aim for anything past the second stack. Just concentrate your fire that way. The whole thing will go sky high. Now, this is their construction, and it does produce, on paper, quite a strong ship. It also sort of harks back to some of the earlier cruiser designs, because you've got this sort of armoured deck just above the waterline and this armoured belt over there, and then you've got an almost A-frame structure above it. The turrets, as we can see, are chocker. The only way to describe them, chocker. And they're powered by six water tube boilers, supplying four geared steam turbines. But those are coupled also with two man 10 cylinder diesel engines. Overall, supplying 65,000 shaft horsepower. Top speed, 32 knots. A range of 5,700 nautical miles <coughs> at 19 knots. It's funny looking at these ships. <coughs> they are, to me, as much a product of the need to build something as the Deutschland class are. They really are. I have a big picture of one sitting on the screen in front of me while I'm talking about this, and it just looks like someone has decided they're going to build a 1920 style 1910 cruiser and then shove modern guns on it. It's riddled with portholes. At 174 metres long, 15.3 metres wide, and uh, for a draft of 6.28 metres, they're not exactly large ships. Cable ships. And 6,100 tonnes in standard. Um, 7,800 tonnes in full. Point is this, okay? The Germans are not allowed to build capital ships. There's a huge furor above that, and some need to build a Deutschland class. But they are building smaller ships, so efficiency to designs are available there. You can scale up a destroyer design efficiency into a cruiser. They are able to build some of those, they're able to build torpedo boats. They have got some construction going on, and this is constructed in these are constructed in the 1920s. There is... Kronzberg is laid down in 1926, launched 1927, commissioned 1929. Karush is 26, 27, 29. Holm is 28 and commissioned in... Uh, laid, launched in 1928, commissioned in 1930, laid down in 1927. These ships, all of them, are built and in service and very critical to the German Navy in its performance at the beginning of World War I, World War II. But they could have also been built for the World War I German Navy. Because once you start digging below the depth, a lot of the stuff you're looking at is World War One, and we can understand that because they haven't built anything. But they've been designing stuff for the Dutch. They've been their German design schools have been kept going around the world. 
working on the things for other nation. This design just screams of something which is less than it could be. When we're talking about their capital ship design, we often point out that the Nisenauer Scharnhorst is an actually a far more efficient design than Turpitz and Bismarck. And in many ways, if they had kept churning out Scharnhorst and Nisenauer types, maybe upgraded their guns, but otherwise just kept turning out the same ship, they could have probably built more capital ships. If there's one area the Germans really need to start churning ships out, it's light cruisers. Because if you want to sortie a battleship or something larger into the Atlantic Ocean for surface raiding, whether to attack the French or attack the British, you need cruisers to escort it. The destroyers aren't going to keep up. There's a reason Prince Jürgen is there with Bismarck at the Battle of Denmark Strait. She's there because they need an escort. But she's also pretty much the only thing available to escort her. That's a problem. A decent light cruiser could have made a big, big problem for the Royal Navy. Should have been a mine laying light cruiser. Well, they're always attractive to the Germans, and they if they are going to do a mine laying light cruiser, you'd expect it to carry a lot more mines. Should have been a torpedo light, light cruiser. Well, that certainly would be an attractive thing to have, especially if you wanted to pull in sort of the destroyable role at long range for your task groups by being able to launch a big spread of torpedoes. But then it would have needed far more torpedoes. Did it need a gunnery like cruiser able to drive off French and British destroyers? Yes! Well, that would have been useful, but then it's going to need better all around firepower. If we go back to this fire analysis page, at the beginning, this one. Think about the destroyer crews they're building the place. Russian ones. Well, if, they, if they're in a scenario where if they come home with your head, they get to keep theirs. If they come home without your head, they probably don't get to keep theirs. How long is it going to take them to work out that, oh, yeah, if we attack from this side on the stern, or opposite side slightly off the, off the forward bow, you can't attack us. And the thing is, destroyers are going to be nimbly Trying, coming around to try and fire, get close and fire torpedoes. They don't have to be in those areas for long. They have to be in them for long enough to give them a statistical chance. Yes, you can cover all the way around with firepower. But you can't cover everywhere to the same extent. And if I know where your weak spots are, and in this class it's fairly obvious where your weak spots are going to be, I can deploy my destroyers, because it'll be multiple destroyers, it won't be a single destroyer attacking, it won't be one on one, light cruiser versus destroyer. No, no, no. It will be flotilla for eight destroyers versus light cruiser. And once they get past you, then they get to the battleship. That's what they want to do, after all. Knowing that? Hmm. So, is an attempt to fill all three roles. Oh, caramba, that is one of those questions which, the more I think about it, the more I wonder. Is it an attempt to fill all three roles? No. I don't think it's also either really an attempt to fill the mine laying role. I think it's, uh, we're going to test out these capabilities. We're going to build something that has a theoretical capability in all three areas. And it's going to be good enough. But it isn't. Konisberg has a pretty interesting career. She's a pretty cool ship. Up until World War II happens. Um, 
she was originally ordered as Cruiser B, given the name, a temporary name, Erzat Fetus. She's intended to replace the Cruiser Fetus in service. She's laid down on a Reichsmarine Waft in the Wilhelmshaven, which I'm going to be doing the discussion of later, in April 1926. She's commissioned into Reichsmarine in 1929, and after her commissioning, she's assigned the duties of flagship of the reconnaissance force for the German fleet. This is the quite interesting question I started thinking about when I looked at these ships. Were they designed as reconnaissance ships? 32 knot speed, bit of mine lane capability, bit of gunnery capability, bit of torpedo capability, and the ability to carry an aircraft. Is that what forced compromise beyond everything else? No. Because the aircraft. For her, uh, for her reconnaissance role, are really not in, are not actually installed until 1935. Really, that's when they have an aircraft carrier uh, catapult installed, and it's also in 1935 that her single eight air point eight millimeter, eighty eight millimeter guns are replaced with twin mounts. Well. They replaced uh, them with uh, twin mounts, and they added in another two twin mounts. Nice. They had fire control directors for anti-aircraft guns, and during, well, after being employed as a gunnery, uh, gunnery training ship, during the Spanish Civil War, she participated in the non-intervention patrols, during which she forced Republicans to surrender a German freighter they'd seized, and also spent a rather long time with the Royal Navy cruiser, usually playing and going, Hello! How are you doing today? Oh, we're just going the same way you are. Oh, you're changing direction. We need to go that way direction too. I think um, it was an Arafusa class was her usual, her usual cover. But there's a debate as to which one it was. Which one was the usual cover? There are two, which seem, including Arafusa, which seem to uh, seem to have the role, but they debate as to which one. Uh, the history books debate as to which one's more commonly giving the role. Now, as mentioned, she was built by the Reichsmarine, Reichsmarine Weft, or Kriegsmarine Weft of Wilhelmshaven, which had previously been the Kaiserlich the Kaiserlich Weft at Wilhelmshaven, with. This lovely symbol. Now, both her and Colm will be built there. And it's a fairly nice place for the construction of ships. It's officially founded after the Imperial Shipyard, the Kaiserlich of Werft, uh, it was closed after World War I. And so it's technically in existence. 1918 to 1945, and is part of the German Navy's base at Wilhelmshaven. In 1935, its name is changed to the Kriegsmarine well, uh, for, uh, changed to Kriegsmarine Weft. Proves that it had been Reichsmarine. So when they were built, it's the Reichsmarine. When they're in service and getting their maintenance, it's now the Kriegsmarine. Um, between 1939 and 1945, the RAF bombed it several times, including on the 18th of December 1939, when 12 out of 22 of the RAF's Wellington bombers were shot down in an air battle over the base. It has an interesting career in terms of building ships, and this again has a factor, I think, in German naval ship design. Because there's one thing what you're able to design, there's another thing what you're able to build with the industry you have available. Between 1920 and 1922, they built 28 fishing vessels. In 1922, they built four cargo ships. In 1925, they built Endon. 
1926 to 28, they built six torpedo boats. These are some of them. Type 24 torpedo boats. 1929, it's the K8 it's Konigsberg, which is bombed. In 1930, it's Kong. In 1921, it's Brems, which is a gunnery training ship. And then they start getting the job of building the Deutschland class of Panzerschiff. The Admiral Scheer first, and then the Graf Bay. And then they build the Scharnhorst, and then they build Turbots. And after that, they basically concentrate on Type 7 submarines. So, in another way, we can see the K class, the Königsberg class, as steps on the path that eventually results in the Tirpitz. And you see, there's the problem here is. I know how it should go, but also there's a reality of how it's going to go because of the effects of Model 1, because of the treaty system. So yeah, I can forgive them to an extent some of the design issues, but they could have done so much better. They really could. Now, during Operation Wurzbank, the ships, the cruisers, do take part. All three of them are critical to it. And that, of course, is the on the left of the screen is the symbol of the 69th Division, which is one of the critical units that Germans deploy in it. Anyway, Group 3, that includes Köln and Königsberg and Brems, all, of course, from uh, what is the, by this point Kriegsmarine, uh, Werft Wilhelm. They go up to Bre uh, to Bergen and drop off 1,900 troops up there. Whereas Kalfrush, Kalfrush uh, along with three torpedo boats, is taking a whole of his troops, 1,100 troops, to Christiansand in Group 4. That's two of the critical groups. You needed Bergen, you needed Kusinsan, you needed those areas. And they wouldn't have got done without these ships. These ships are the heavy hitters of those groups, but also the troop the ships that can carry the most troops, thanks to being mine layers. They have space. The other advantage of building a mine layer, you don't have to justify why you're building a ship with extra space. And ability to carry more top weight, or weight higher up in the hull, than you would normally design for. Kalthru, well, she's a special ship. She's also one of the ones we've discovered on the water, and we've spotted her. But she is built in a different yard. She's built in a Deutschwerk. And she was ordered as Cruiser C. So these are cruisers at B, C, and D. And them have been Cruiser A. She was again originally supposed to be named a different name. She was supposed to be made um, named Medusa. But they decided they preferred Carl Shrew. Which is an interesting name in German experience because there was a light cruiser which of the Carl Shrew class, which had been launched in 1912, was sunk in 1914. There was a 1916 Konigsberg class vessel. That and of course, there was this 1927 vessel. There was also a Erzat Kalsru, which was a Con class vessel, a light cruiser as well. They like the name. Anyway, whereas Konigsberg had spent its pre-war time being a flagship and doing those duties. 
Carol Shrew, well, had a slightly different career. She completed sea trials in the Baltic Sea after ending service, and was then assigned to training ship duty. In May 1930, she went on her first OC training cruise, visiting Africa and South America. After returning to Germany, she was modernised later in the year. Her full mast shortened, her rear superstructure slightly enlarged, and over the next five years, she embarked on four more world cruises for naval cadets. She was, in many ways, the most visible member of the German Navy. She travelled as far as Japan during those two cruises. During each cruise, she conducted exercises with the rest of the German fleet in, war in German waters. Uh, Gunther Lugens served as the ship's commander from September 1934 to September 1935. Then she had more modifications made, including installation of a pole mast at the funnels, after the funnels and an aircraft catapult. Her last training cruise was in 1936. And during this, she was badly damaged by a tropical storm in the Pacific Ocean. And the structural weaknesses in her mostly welded hull plating caused the damage to worsen and get more complicated as times go on. She actually ends up being forced into San Diego in April for repairs. Hulls repaired and strengthened. This increased her displacement and beam slightly, compared to her sisters. She returned to Germany in 1936, June 1936, and immediately went into dry dock for more permanent repairs and a major overhaul. During this period, it's when she had her 88mm upgraded to the new twin mounts. So she went from two single mounts to three twin mounts. Fire control directors were also installed for these guns, and it was after emerging from the refit she took part in sea trials and then joined the, again herself the non information patrols from the Spanish Civil War. Again, though, she ends up with a Leander class unit covering her. Her war service was interesting, but of course, so she was the one built by the Deutsche Werk, and she it's kind of interesting, I think, that it's the, you know, Group 3 are all the ships which come from the Kriegsmarine Werft, and then the Deutsche Werft uh, ships are what's in Group 4. I'm not sure if the German Navy was going for dividing up by which shipyards the ships came from, but that's what they achieved. Deutsche Werft. They're another interesting yard. Um, they're a shipbuilding company founded in 1925 when Kaiserlich, Kiel, and other shipyards were merged together. Basically, it's a product of the Treaty of Versailles, where everything's forced to tr shrink. They started building merchant uh, ships, but they had problems. They had problems in that they never really got enough orders. And so when the Nazi party gained power in 1933, they shifted production from being occasional warships to and uh, mostly merchant ships to being far more naval ship orientated. They're also the shipyard which builds the Deutschland, which builds the Bloka, the Neisenau, the Graf Zeppelin, and various destroyers and U-boats. So they're quite uh, quite a good yard. But honestly, that's not what they're most famous for around the world. In fact, this is going to go in a slightly random direction because they're quite famous around the world for something else. Your TGs, the 7.65mm normally, Hamler semi-automatic pistol. Although you can also get it in a 6.5 5mm and a 9mm curves variant. And the 9mm curves variant is kind of an interesting weapon because on that one, my granddad's brother had one of those in World War II. He handed it in at the end, but he did have it during the war. He had a second pistol, which he'd managed to acquire somewhere. He came back from Norway with him. So he had a 9mm Kurz, as well as his Browning. Which he considered a sensible thing, because it, they took the same ammunition. Got a cutaway diagram of it, and all this thing. But this is quite a famous 
pistol is. Uh, Heinrich Otigius designed the pistol while living in Belgium during World War I. After the war, he moves to Erfurt in Germany, where he starts building in 1919. He makes his own factory. Uh, the weapons, Bordermark, Ortigis & Co., Erfurt. And eventually the production is passed over to the Deutsche Werk in 1921. After they buy it, and buy it off, and basically they go, well, you're building this, but would you like money so you could go and do your own inventions, and we'll take over the construction of this very good product. And they kept building them. Production ceased officially in 1924. And no Ortigis were produced with a chrome finish. Or factory engraving, apart from one known example. However, we do know that Adolf Hitler presented Ava Braun with an Ortigi 6.35mm, which has been sold many times because it came with a small gold plate, uh, gold plate inlaid into the side of the slide, stamped Ava Braun as a present to her. We also know that in the 1920s, they were absolutely prized as a shooting competition pistol. If you were doing pistol competitions, I think one point there was like 70%, 70, 70, 70 of the, there are various figures going around, but there are, most seem to agree that roughly 70% of principal shooting competitions winners used this pistol. And it's the basis for many, many other pistols which are developed in the period. So it's unusual design features, including a safety and a magazine and all these things are something which are picked up. This is one of the most important pistols. And personal defense weaponry, as I would classify it as. And it comes from the same people who were building ships. However, you'll notice there's this little picture here. Well, we found the wreck of the Karlsruhe. And why does it make it interesting? Well, because of how she ended up becoming a wreck. Hmm. Thanks to HMS True. And I am now going to resist all the urge to make jokes about the Germans shouldn't have been out of school and play, playing out of school and invading Norway and all those other things because they were sunk by HMS Trunk. But let's start off with this. The invasion force departed for Operation Wolfsburg from Bremen on the 8th April 1940. She was under the command of Captain Zussi, Friedrich Reeve, and he was in charge of his uh, force as well as his ship. When it arrived at Christiansand, heavy fog covered the area and it made the passage of the fjord outside the harbour very dangerous, naturally. Let's be honest, fog is not good for moving ships around close to shore, especially not in Norwegian fjords. The German ships therefore had to wait until the morning and night before them to begin to attack. As Karashu entered the port fjord, she came under heavy fire from Norwegian coastal guns at Odiera Fortress. The cruiser had to turn full broadside to get, uh, bring all her guns to bear onto the fortress because of the position they were in. Because of stabilizing, uh, stabilizing the guns. Honestly, I consider this to be a bit of a lie. Because when you're stabilizing the guns at certain angles, you have an even more cut down angle of fire. Eventually, Norwegians surrendered an hour later, and the German ships landed their embarked troops. Karshu then left Christian Sand in the evening and night with three of the torpedo boats as escorts. As she was leaving, well, Royal Navy submarine had thought, hmm, there'd be Germans in there. 
I will sit out here. That submarine was HMS Truant. Now, HMS Truant is a very special T class, or rather, not so special T class, because as we all know, the T class have one particularly good saving grace. Something that makes them absolutely beautiful. They are designed as ambush predators. They have six internal forward facing 21 inch torpedo tubes, which can be reloaded. You have six reloads them. But they also have four external forward facing tubes. So she can fire a spread of 10. And guess what I'm going to say happens. Trunt sees the German ships. He doesn't really take much, she aims as much as he feels like it. But she fires a full spread of torpedoes. Kalshru um, took a base of action, but one torpedo struck her on the starboard side amidships, which blasted a huge hole in her because, as we, if we go back, have a look at this lovely, lovely design of a how to build a light cruiser. There isn't really much spacing between a huge central cavity, is there? There is latitudinal bon uh, bulkheads, but the longitudinal bulkhead, not there. Surprising how much of our stay such is together, but shows she sank due to water. Nothing else. This large hole allowed in a lot of water. The flooding disabled her engines and electrical generators, which cut off power to the pumps that they were trying to keep pace. So they, they, just the pumps are in the bad position as well. So the pumps are in a position where they're not going to get flooded, but the power supply, which is going to supply them, can get flooded. Small little design issue, just a small one. Stick a diesel generator somewhere in the ship, you know, high up where it's not going to get flooded, maybe. Don't worry, the Germans aren't the only navy which have that issue, but um, for some reason, when I talk about them having that issue, people look at me and go, "But they're German. They have designed their ships so good, so well." And you go, "No, no, they're not." It is the it is the fault of the Treaty of Versailles and various other things, but let's be honest, the pre World War One and World War One German Navy war has moments of good of good of brilliance and goodness, but is it's not that great either in some respects, because the Navy is always suffering from having to push up against both its own army and everyone else's expectations of it. With the pumps not working, Reeve decides there's no hope of saving the car shrew and issues orders to abandon the ship two hours after the attack. Griff, the torpedo boat, then takes off her crew and fires two more torpedoes into the car shrew to scuttle her. Think about that. And think about that from the perspective of what Truant was designed for. Truant wasn't designed for the Norwegian fjords. Yeah, she can do well there, but she's not designed for them. She's designed for the Far East. There are supposed to be T classes out in the South China Sea waiting to ambush the Japanese. Fire a spread of torpedoes, get out of there. That's the reason you have 10 torpedoes to fire in your spread. Because that's a dense enough spread that if you fire it in a group of ships, you're bound to hit something. And if you actually sink a ship, well, that's useful. But if you just damage a ship, well, that can be even more useful because a sunk ship can be left behind and you can carry on. But a ship which is damaged, well, you're now not going to need to escort it. You're going to need to make a decision as to whether or not you recover it, what you're going to do with it. There are some people who play rules of war nicely. 
Heat class are not designed to play in nice. Kong. Of course, the other vessel from the Kriegsmarine left. How do I put this? Kong is a special ship. She is the vessel which survives the longest. But she doesn't have necessarily the best career. In fact, honestly, you can say that prior to World War II, when she's Cruiser D and she's contracted on name Erzat Arxona, replacement for, again, the old Cruiser Arxona, She is already the last of her class. They've already decided that, frankly, yes, we built three of them. Nah, they're not. What are we building them for? This is again the trouble the Deutschen class. It's the German Navy in the 1920s and the early 1930s doesn't really have direction. They are building ships for the sake of building ships. And you can see in the ships they built. You can see it. Because what could look like an innovation, then we start go, well, yes, and what you've done is you've put both turrets aft where your mines are going and where your torpedo reloads are carried and where all that stuff is. Um, would it have been better to have redesigned the ship and even if you put them on the same level without one super firing over the other, two turrets forward? If you're not worried about having more than three guns firing forward, you could have put them on the same level up front and moved things back a bit. If you'd wanted to, you could have kept X turret position raised up, center line, and then removed Y and put Y into the B position. So they'd all been on the same level, which would have made fire control an absolute dream. We'll leave that to one side. Colin is special. She's upgraded almost from the beginning with, mod with modified air defense from managing the service. She goes on a sort of Atlantic cruise in the early 1932. This is important because this is the German Navy trying to rebuild its knowledge of the world and its presence in the world. And that's what these ships really are doing. They're going around the world showing the flag. Again, it's going to sound strange. This could look very impressive. Yeah, I have nine six-inch guns. Most navies, though, looking at them are going... And this has an impact, okay? I don't think anything specific is done by the Germans in the, with this aim, but there is a certain impact of seeing some of the German designs, and this doesn't come back in the post-World War II literature, but definitely in the pre-World War II literature, where navies like the US Navy, the Japanese Navy, the Italian Navy, the Royal Navy, the French Navy, are looking at German designs and going, hmm... You're capable, but you've made some really strange decisions. And not strange in a, ooh, we'd like to emulate and test it out because it could be a good idea way, but in a, we all know that's not a good thing to do. There is a story that when she's, I think when she's meeting a Brazilian officer aboard, but I don't know in what circumstance. I don't think it's actually in Brazil. I think it's he's a naval attaché. Anyway, the Brazilian officer is walking around her and is being shown stern and the area of all the things they have there. And he is seen to be getting visibly nervous. And this was noted by a British attaché. Or maybe a attaché. It was there. It was there. So I think, I think it must have been a different port. It is both... If there's a Brazilian, if the Royal Navy attaché is making a point of there being a Brazilian officer there. Anyway. 
Because in Brazil, it'd be unremarkable Brazilians there, but in any of else, it would be. All right. So they're going around. And the Brazilian officer is getting quite worried about the way things are stacked up. He doesn't like it. He especially doesn't like it because apparently he spots sailors. Smoking, according to a report in the Royal Navy, so and the Royal Navy guy. So I'm not quite sure. And he doesn't think they should be smoking, even though they're not in the actual spaces. Shouldn't be smoking that close to the spaces, which have such a range of explosives nearby them. I'm sure on a world cruise they're not actually carrying mines, but that story stuck in my head. I read it in a. Ooh. Not in this book. I don't know. But it's in another one of um, McMurtry's books. It's one of McMurtry's. Reginald Bacon McMurtry, it's a um, modern naval strategy from the 1930s. Got a list of his books in here, but I know it's one of the McMurtry books I read the story in. I think it was a my I think it was his, his Travels as a Naval Attache. But it just stuck in my head and going, okay. Why? Why is that affecting you? Why is that worrying you? And it's because of the layout, I think. I think the layout there I, I think there's obviously things in the layout which are look great on paper to the designers. But which, if you've got the experience of operating ships, you would never do. And probably the reason the designers have made the decision is because there isn't literature around about those things because it's just an unspoken design decision. It's an unspoken thing. You don't do that. If you tried to push it through with the in the third sea lord's office, would stop you with the Royal Navy or anything. They just go no. And I think that's the issue with German ships. Sometimes when I'm looking at them, there are lots of things which are, they have lost so much institutional knowledge at the end of World War I. They have lost so much institutional memory. And they have had such a scattering to the four winds of people, of constructors, of naval officers, of people who know what they're doing. And then they've had all the issues in the a term on the Weimar Republic and all the things going on. That they have lost some of the things you know not to do. And that's why I look at their designs and I go, on paper you could do so well, but what, what, what's happened here? Anyway. Uh, after her Atlantic tour, she returns to Germany, takes a crew of naval cadets, on a tour of the world, and then goes on another world tour. She goes to Pacific, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean, in Australia. Her tour stops included Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, and Hobart, and the crew taking place in pub-sized football games against local teams, including a Royal Australian Navy team in Sydney, <coughs> which turned into a bit of a grudge match. It's also quite a cool game, the story, uh, the history of it, and there are some pictures around of it if you go and search. Uh, you will find links to those pictures in the Australian National Maritime Museum, and it's worthwhile looking them up. For a video, because of copyright, as I understand. So um, you can go find them online on the Australian National, uh, <coughs> National <coughs> Maritime Museum website. Anyway. Cole had an interesting career and, as said, did serve through World War II. She just gets sunk at the end, but she spends most of her time in World War II, after Operation Rosberg, being used as a test ship for this. The Fletner FL-282 Hummingbird, or Colbury, intermeshing rotor helicopter, designed by Anton Fletner of which first flew in 1941, was introduced in 1942, and retired in 1945. 
whilst the Luftwaffe were the users and 24 were built, they were actually supposed to be for naval operations. Um, the A1 was a single seat naval reconnaissance type for cruisers and other warships. And the A2 was supposed to be for submarines with a special deck, which was never built. And the uh, B1 and B2 were two seat land reconnaissance layers on helicopters. They spent most of their naval testing was done on on. It's a cool idea, and if they had managed to get it working, they would have been pretty darn useful. Although not exactly long range, but it would have been useful. So here's a summary, and here is another lovely drawing of these ships. The more you look at this design, the more you see just how crammed in it is. The 88mm aft have their directors there, the control systems there, but it's a case of engines, then you have torpedoes, 88s, and then 150mm, and mines all the way underneath that. That is a very crowded end. And yes, you can say by doing that, you are keeping away from all the heat of the boilers. You can structure them off, and it is kind of like the all four arguments for the all four arrangement of weaponry. But um, that's a lot of explo different types of explosives not too far away from each other. They're useful ships. But honestly, the German Navy did need light cruisers. And it needed a lot of them to make up for its issues. They were probably the sweet spot of a ship you could build with sufficient range and firepower to act as a surface radar which is going to absorb the attention of the Royal Navy, or the French Navy, or any Navy, but not so large that anyone was going to really consider them a massive threat or was going to put too strain, much strain on the industry in constructing them. And yet, they get almost no attention. And the only real reason I can give that for it is because of the way they're used, or rather, not used. The Königsberg class go down in Norway, two thirds of them. But there's one still sitting there. The Leipzig class. They're built next. And there are two of those built. I'll be talking about those. One of them ends up serving with the Soviet Navy. But if you add in M, that means you have six light cruisers. Six light cruisers that are modern for the German Navy in World War Two. Emden is nineteen early nineteen twenties construction. She's been in service so long that frankly she might as well be a World War II, World War One build. She's the equivalent of the E class in many respects. The German Navy churns out three of these ships. They could have churned out more. There was nothing really stopping them. Yes, there are treaties and things like that, but honestly, if they built light cruisers, most navies in the world would have probably looked at them and gone, hmm, especially the numbers I'm talking about. The Germans didn't need to build hundreds of light cruisers. They needed a dozen service. They needed them as escorts for the bigger ships. They needed them as fight as reconnaissance. They needed them as surface raiders. They needed them for many, many things. 
and yet they don't build them. This is a hodgepodge class. This is a class which, yes, it has the mine laying capability. Oh, yay, you remembered what happened in World War One, how useful your mine layers were. Yes. Did I use it? No. Okay. They have the gunfire capability. Did I use it? Hmm. Not really. We don't put them in situations where they can do, and to be honest, they aren't really designed for things like the North Sea or the North Atlantic, because would you like to be in the North Atlantic in a hull which is shaped like that? Not really. So they're mainly Baltic ships. So you're going into a narrow space in the Baltic where your weakest firepower is forward. It's great on paper, I'm sure, because I, I, this is the thing. Every time I look at this ship and this design, if I just take out those bits, don't use the drawing, just use those bits individually. And I'm looking at the sign on paper, I'm going, hmm, this could be really interesting. But the moment I look at it in the sort of 3D structure, in profiles, the moment I start taking it apart and looking at points like this, the design of the turret, the hull shaping. The moment I start really looking at the ship pictures and looking at their war record and their service and how they're used, the more I feel sorry for them. The other videos, the reason I've cut them is mostly I felt I was too harsh. I felt I was being nasty to class and it's not their fault. They are a product of the Reichsmarine. They are a product of the Kriegsmarine. They are a product of their navies. But they are not really built by them. And when I say that, I mean the navies keep shifting around in terms of what they want. And so they order something, because it's better than nothing. But they're not really involved in the process of building. To my mind, these ships are no more representative of what the Kriegsmarine or Reichsmarine wants in terms of light cruisers than their destroyers are. They're ordered because they need to order something, not because they really know what they want. And that's what you, why you end up with this sort of ship. This is why you end up with a ship which has things which, honestly... The naval officers in the Krieg, in the Kriegsmarine, in the Reichsmarine, should have spotted and should have gone, yes, I know that's a nice idea on paper, but before we go too far, no. Because there's on paper and there's reality. On paper, it's brilliant to store all your you know, different ammunition together and have the magazine calling and all these things. Lovely. In reality, you want spacing. Because certain ammunition types are slightly more likely to have, uh, have issues than others. And if you're going to have issues with those, you want them to be as far away from the others, which tend to be the bigger ones that have the bigger bang. They have potential. On paper. On paper, if you read off those stats, you can build a very interesting ship. But not these ships. Because people were involved and they didn't really care. That's the thing I ultimately, the decision I come to, they look like they are because the people don't care. I find it enjoyable. We've got next week. 
with the Glorious Heritage class. They're going to be fun. And the week after that, we have the Pathfinder class, and then we have a La, La Argentina. Mm-hmm. going to be fun. Take care, everyone. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And this will go live on the 8th as soon as it can.